Ladies and gentlemen, analysts and associates, welcome to your managing director secretary's favorite podcast, The Big Swinging Dex Podcast by Liquidity and Mark Moran. This is not financial advice. You'd be a bottom bucket analyst to make investment decisions based on what is discussed on this show. Welcome back to another edition of Big Swinging Decks. Lit, how the hell are you today? Thanks for always asking this, Mark. I'm feeling fucking fantastic. That, that's what you pay me for, you know? I'm just here to make sure my boss is having a phenomenal fucking day. You are my de facto therapist, Mark, and bringing me joy every day. Uh, you know what? That's As we create this discussion around mental health, that's what I'm here to do. And... I can be more excited for the guests that we have today. How about you? Yeah. So with us today, we have the face of FinTwit, financial Twitter, Douglas Bonaparte. You may recognize him from his pompadour hair. He uses Bumble products, as we come to find out in this interview for anyone wondering. But we're going to dive into Doug's background, to his experience, and to really how he grew himself as one of, if not the most notable certified financial planners on social media. And also his daily hair routine. And his daily hair routine, which, you know, I mean, look, we're also a hair care products based podcast. So, you know, we're not going to let you guys get away without some good tips. <laughs> Actually, though, before we get into that, just one random thought. Have you seen this Kramer tracker on Twitter? Oh, yeah. Dude, I'm Something loving it. Just, yeah, it came out of nowhere, but it's it's catching steam. I'm really curious to see what the data or data, depending on uh, how you look at it, is going to show, which uh, I'm not I'm not going to say I have done this. But like as a journalist with a capital J, I'm curious as to what it was. So I reached out to the guy on Twitter and after like a day, he replied to me and he's like, you'll see soon enough. So we'll, we'll see what the data has to reveal. But after that little tangent. Oh, the other thing we got today is we got a very, very interesting appendix section with some great banking stories, some horror stories and some hero stories that we're going to send to you guys via Instagram story to vote on and send two people to the Super Bowl. Yeah, th this one, if you guys remember, we were essentially asking people to submit their horror stories or hero stories of banking. And it's for a giveaway that we're doing with the virtual data room called Ansarada. Uh, that I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. And so the prize is definitely tickets to the Super Bowl that's coming up in a few weeks. So uh, you're going to want to listen to this through the end. Amazing. Let's roll into it. Let's do it. So with us today, we have a very special guest, Douglas Bonaparte, who you may know from Twitter as the financial advisor to millennials. Douglas, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here. Now, first first question for you, just off the bat, how tall are you? Uh, six foot one. So you're basically six four with the hair then? I just needed to know. Yeah, that <laughs> probably gives me another two and a half inches, so shy of six four. <laughs> Starting it off strong, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, we're, we're here with the hard-hitting questions lit. That's what we do on Big Swinging Decks. Well, you know what they say, the, the taller the hair, the closer to God, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And inflation adjusted, that's basically six feet these days. So <laughs> there you go. So, so Douglas, tell us a little bit about your background, how you came up to New York. You're from Florida originally, correct? Yeah, I'm from God's Waiting Room, Boca Raton, Florida, and uh, decided to make the move back to my homeland of New York. I, I was born there. Born in White Plains, born, you know, the son of two New Yorkers. My mom's from Yonkers, dad's from mm -hmm. Harrison, and just made the round trip because working with my dad was tough. It was good, but it was too tough. And and the person I loved most in this world, my my now wife, was in law school. So after I finished college and at UF, it didn't take too long to realize where I needed to be. Gotcha. So you found your way up to New York, but prior to that, so you're at University of Florida trying to figure out what you wanted to do in life. And so you took uh, you took a few exams while you were there when you were pretty young to start practicing, right? Yeah. So that's something I do thank my dad for. I think I think he saw I was having a little too much fun in college. You know, this this was the University of Florida, Gator football. Tim Tebow showed up 
when I was, uh, a, a, by the time I was a senior, uh, we were doing all right, but things, you know, and we had the basketball, of course, basketball. We had two national, mm-hmm. look, I had three mm-hmm. national championships in the last three semesters of my college <laughs> experience. And there's probably, you know, you're probably never going to top that ever. So we're pretty spoiled Gator fans. Yeah, man, he, he saw I was having a lot of fun, like right off the bat. So after my freshman year, I figured I'd just stay at school because it was fun, right? I'd just <laughs> stay at my fraternity house and and have a blast. And he was kind of like, yeah, so uh, how about you come home for half the summer and maybe you want to learn, you know, something in, in the world of finance. And I was like, yeah, fine, whatever, you know, as long as I can get back to school. And I, sh- I came home and there was a Series 7 manual on my bed. And he says, see if you can knock this thing out before you head back. And I was like, well, look, you know, I'm taking tests every semester anyways. What's, what's one more? It's sunny and warm. I'll go to the pool. I'll crack open a beer. And I'll, I'll read this material and try and pass me an exam before before we head back. I thought it was pretty cool. And I did. And I did. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, how, how did that transition happen after uh, graduating and getting started? And like, how did the career come about? It was it was tough start. You know, I, I always joke about how, you know, 23 through maybe 25, 26 is actually one of the most awkward times of your life. I call it like puberty 2.0. Your body's not changing, but virtually everything else is. Old, you know, the older folks don't respect you, the younger folks don't respect you. You really are trying to find where you fit in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, seeing what that college degree, if you got one, can do for you. And if you come from out of New York to New York, you can get humbled really fast. I mean, I remember being unhappy for for uh I don't know if it was unhappy or just hedging my bet because when I showed up in New York, Lehman collapsed and it, it was, you know, a shit storm. It was the beginning of, of the end. That was the day you showed up to New York, correct? Yeah, I got off the plane and Lehman collapsed. Wow. Like I'm like, all right, <laughs> let me just get back on the plane and go home. <laughs> it's like that uh, Simpsons meme. Like you walk in the yeah, door. Yeah, <laughs> Grandpa Simpson coming in, coming out, yeah. right? That's, that's exactly what it was. I met my <laughs> random Craigslist roommate. I think he was crying over like 20 grand he lost on Washington Mutual. Equity research analyst like just made a bad bet that day. My wife in law school like, are there going to be any jobs? And I'm just like, well, you know, I got four boxes waiting for me in an apartment um, and I don't even own a bed. You know, mm-hmm. we're going to give this a go. But yeah, I mean, it really was a lot of unhappiness at home and, and trying to figure myself out. And when you're living at home and also working in the family business, it's it's not really the best recipe for success unless you have like a, a one of a kind, really amazing relationship with your dad. And and I love my dad and we have a good relationship. But look, at 24, 25, you know, that's living at home. It was a little depressing. It was hard on the relationship. And right. again, you know, the person I had dated throughout college and, and wanted to be with and currently am with was in New York doing New York things. Things and and it was just a personal disaster and hard time. So out the door, I went to New York and, and likely the worst the worst of times to do it. You leave Florida, you come up here, and you know for most young financial advisors starting their career, they're going to be focused on kind of bringing in older clients with lots of money. You, however, took a very different approach. What led to that, and what kind of gave you this idea to be targeting millennials? Right. So. If you are even today in wealth management going to a major firm or a large uh, practice ensemble or whatever it may be, you know, the adage is go raise, go raise $10 million or, or in two years or less or get out. Even if you're doing private banking at Goldman, my buddy, you know, finished with his MBA at Yale, went to Goldman. They're like, raise a hundred million, you know, in, in two years or get out. It's the same game, Does, you know, different call directory and, and you're cold calling and doing, you know, stuff from the old day of trying to sling products and stocks and things like that, even if you try and polish that up with with a nice name behind it. And, you know, I, I said there, you know, there has to be a better way, right? But I think really what it was, was watching, you know, my 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 girlfriend, now wife, watching Heather, we'll just go with Heather from now on, watching mm-hmm. Heather <laughs> basically see this promise of of the gener- to the generation of if you, if you go educate yourself, go take out the loans, if you educate yourself, you'll get a good job, you'll be all right. Well, when you go to the tail ends of that and you go to the extreme ends of the borrowing to get expensive educations like a law degree, right, mm-hmm. and, and a good one at that, and then the economy blows up in another extreme setting and you see that that bet is not going to work as well 
or at all. And you now have put yourself in, in kind of a pretty precarious financial situation, right? You got 300 grand in debt. You're supposed to get a job that pays you 160. That's market for top hundred big law firm in New York back then. Mm -hmm. And you're like, all right, I can, I can make these loan payments. And if I hate law or whatever it is I'm doing, I can, you know, be out of that in four or five years. They can have my pound of flesh and I got a nice degree and a lot of experience and I can go make money. Yeah. When that evaporates, when that breaks down, there's big problems and, and that hit us all up, you know, in a bad way for many, many years. We got a delayed start based on a promise that that didn't work out. And I'm sitting, you know, I'm like, all right, what do we do here? We go to business school. We go get an MBA and take out another $120,000 in student loan debt because I was approaching it from, you know, the way that most weren't. How do I get an ROI on this education? Like methodic, you know, I'm a financial yeah. advisor. Like you got to think methodically about this from a planning perspective, which was, all right, how many clients do I need to get in year one, two, three? And I was like, all right, this, this, you know, if, if I can't do that, like I'm pretty bad at this and I maybe shouldn't be doing it at all. The math worked out really well for me. And I'm sitting in my MBA class at Stern looking around, I'm doing the part-time program and everyone in there is hustling like so proud of all my classmates burning midnight oil you mm -hmm. know doing full full day's work to come at night spend three hours to get this credential to to improve their lives and i'm like god damn there it is that's that's the aha moment these are the clients these are the people to grow with let's do the exact opposite what the industry is saying you should do what the profession says which is chase around boomers pre-retirees post-retirees with assets because that's the revenue model and i'm like nah i'm gonna do i'm good at that i'm gonna do that to float myself and make the long-term investment in in millennials right in us because everyone mm -hmm. in that room was a hitter every guy every girl was crushing it and i knew if you just gave them time they would be probably some of the best clients you could ever have. They would be young. All the money would be ahead of them. You could really bring impact. I was like, oh my God, check, 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 check. Let's go. And I started to build a practice around that theme. That sounds a little bit like uh, venture capital. You know, when you think about getting in early yeah. at the ground floor, right? You're like saying, hey, these guys have potential to really be the next business leaders. And if you plant the seed of like the, the relationship and, and build from there, they'll come to you as they grow and their earnings grow, their net worths grow. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty smart and uh, kudos to you Thanks, for man. that. Yeah. Thanks, man. And, and, you know, I love that you called it, you know, like VC and I always use that as an example, right? And I use it in the context of the older clients that look, you're from Boca, you should be pretty good at getting older clientele. <laughs> right. So again, thank you for, you know, growing up in South Florida and, and knowing how to be everyone's grandchild. You know how many delis I've been to, you know, in, in South <laughs> Florida at four o'clock, you know, it's bedtime in a couple hours yeah. and you know, you're everyone's grandson, but interestingly, those, those clients were, were the funding, right? They were, they were almost the VC. They were the one, they were my seed funding so that I could pay my bills and eat, right? right. And have a few, and, and at least have a fail safe here while I went after the long play, the long-term play, which wouldn't, you know, bear fruit for, for many, many years down the road and, and likely, you know, where we are today. You know, what, one of the things I love about your story, which I think is very similar to a lot of people, including myself. So I went to law school and business school right after undergrad, yeah. took out loans, came up to work on Wall Street to pay them off, right? And you're very out there and open and kind of vulnerable about that, right? And talking about your path to financial freedom with your wife, mm -hmm. developing stable family finances, raising two daughters, everything like that. And I think that's something that for our generation, we don't see much. And you've really kind of taken advantage of that and become almost the figurehead of the industry and the media. And so would love to hear a little bit about your approach to that when this started, and then uh, we can roll into the Twitter questions next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's easier to say I had it right today when everything's working, you know, it's like 17, mm -hmm. 17 year overnight success story. I mean, I passed my series seven when I was 19. I'm 37 now. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people who are new to seeing us all in, in the financial Twitter, financial meme world and, and, and jump on and find it to be cool. Like, you know, Liddy, bro, I know, I know you've been grinding out in the banking scene for forever. And I, I know yep. with you comes over a decade of real, real deal Wall Street experience. I've been doing this almost two decades now. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question about that, you know, it's easier to, it's easier to say, Hey, it all worked out well for me, you know, having grinded it out. But, 
yeah, you know, I, I, you got to sometimes follow up on your gut and, and where your brain's telling your heart's telling you like, this is that path. Like you can build a business around this. You can do that. Uh, also, a lot of it was like failure was not an option, you know, and you're you, you, you fire under your ass back against the wall. You, you'll find, you know, New York does, does a good job of that. You know, uh, 2008 and nine does a good job of that. Um, when everything's on the line, I don't want to go home. I don't want to fail because, and look, it wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world. All right, maybe I wouldn't, you know, be married with kids. I'd be back down in South Florida doing something else. Like people were losing their jobs and families and lives over what, you know, we experienced uh, 11 plus years ago. But the experience itself, you know, back to that is ultimately what said, what something went off in my mind that says, look, you know, there's, there's a better way to do this. And more importantly, you know, we need help. Like our generation needs help we're not given financial education from our parents. We're not given, you know, if you're lucky if you are. If your school taught it to you, you're also extraordinarily lucky. Government ain't giving it to you, that's for sure. And I was just like, no, th- this can't, you know, this can't continue. When you go through watching the person you love most in this world, you know, reasonably, you know, for good reasons, cry over mm-hmm. what they thought was a smart decision and is now changing the course of their entire life and w- making them doubt themselves and all of these things. And it wasn't just her. It was a lot of our friends. It breaks your heart. And you can either cry about it or do something about it. And I chose with my own path and experience and everything you know, I had done to do something about that. Yeah, primarily for me so I could have a future because I, w- I was stuck in it too. It wasn't, I wasn't absolved of what was happening around me. I was definitely, definitely a part of it. So I think a lot of it's just right place, right time, right events, right experience, getting off the plane at JFK, Lehman collapsing, all of this stuff, you know, I'd do it all over again. I would drink out of that fire hose all over again because it's responsible, you know, for all the advisors I worked with who who either fired me or we separated ways, including my dad. I thank them. I thank each and every single one of them, despite the grief I've, pro- you know, I get it. I, I, I was probably annoying. It was probably me, not them. No, it was definitely them. But it was also me. I thank them because it's impossible to be where I am today without that. And it's impossible to help my generation and do what I think is right, which was the antithesis of what the profession was doing and for the most part is still doing today. But I think the next generation of advisors will ultimately have the last laugh because we're taking this and morphing it into something that works for us, right? Yeah. Something that is relatable to us. I, I, like, I cannot name another financial advisor. You know, I, I think like whenever I see financial advisory or financial advisor, I think of Doug, I think of the hair, and I think of uh, the, the dad jokes. So it's I'm it's honored. a brand, and I mean that's uh, I'm honored. Yeah, it's it's a big um, differentiator, I'd say. So is the hair trademarked? I noticed it was in your logo. <laughs> that, you know, it's so funny. I did the trademark application myself, and I, I think I trademarked bona fide wealth, and it says like upload image, and I just like went into Word and typed in bona fide wealth, and like like here you go. So I don't I don't think the pompadour itself is trademarked. Can you? I guess you can trademark that. That, that may be a question for your wife to look yeah, into. As a lawyer. Yeah, I, yeah. She'll refer me out to some intellectual property attorney. I'm sure. <laughs> I was stalking your Instagram, and one thing that stood out to me, the Bumble products. Are you still using Bumble, or are you going with another company <laughs> these days? Far, What's the answer? How far <laughs> did you go back in... All the way back, baby. All the way back. Wow. I should get my hair cut at Bumble and Bumble in meatpacking after my wife was like, you know, you need to get real serious with, you know... I think it was before our wedding. She's like, go get a real haircut. And I was like, this is ridiculously expensive. They, they did not make it any cheaper for a guy than they did a girl. And, and I just blew tons of money doing that. That. But um, yeah, no, I still use, you're right. I still use Bumble and Bumble thickening spray, hot out the shower and, uh, you know, the Sumo Tech to, to get some texture in there. Thanks, Mark. Hey, I got it. I got it. I just lost your entire audience <laughs> on that one. We, we gained the female following on that one. So, yeah. but actually, speed of our audience. So, we have a, you know, probably an audience that is a little bit higher earner than average. And there's this term, Henry, mm-hmm. high earning, not, not rich. rich yet. Mm-hmm. So, what, what are your thoughts on this kind of new demographic? And how can, what advice can you offer to a group like that who, you know, mid, early, late 20s, they're making about 250000 a year, but they still feel poor. 
I mean, I guess that's relative, right? Relative where they're they're living, what they're experiencing. You know, being addicted to the gram and social media is not very helpful psychologically when you, when you're trying to get a relative measure of how well you're doing when your whole life or people's lives are being filtered away. I also think it's a product of how old you are and how much responsibility you have in your life. And that's not to say 20-something-year-olds don't have a ton of responsibilities. I can show you many 20-something-year-olds with family, with kids, with special needs and and, and tons right. of stuff that's, you know, the real shit. But if you're talking, you know, stereotype, I know your audience extraordinarily well. Um, if you're talking, you know, finance, law, white collar professional earning, you know, multiple six figures and they feel like they're poor, you know, first thing I'd ask, like, is there like six figures in student loan debt behind that? Because I totally get that, right? That is that is such an albatross and a sandbag for a lot of people. Also, if they're in New York, right, LA, San Fran, they're, you're, you know, Boca, there's such spectacular, you know, displays of wealth around you at all times. And, and you can't make good sense of it, right? Like, I, I would always say, is it all flat? no cash or did that person bust their ass today more than ever i say wow the person pushing that porsche probably what did i ask myself what did they do to how hard did they bust their ass to go get that car you know or be in that house that's the positive approach the cynical take is i bet they're levered to the tits you know and and you know there's no assets you know behind them but listen you know my advice to them, I think, is the advice I'd give anybody in that position, and it's about building the strongest foundation you can for yourself. When people feel like they're not rich with high income or have accumulated some assets or are in, quite frankly, a good position to build upon, it usually means they're not in control. Right? They're not in control or they haven't taken the time to organize their financial life in a way to get the relative measure that they're looking for. And, and the relative measure that they're looking for is their own goals. Right, So then I bring up a bigger question. If you don't feel like you're doing well, maybe it's because you don't know what you're trying to achieve. And that's hard for a 25, 6, 7-year-old who, you know, my, my hardest prospect to close is a 26 year old doing well, because mm -hmm. a lot of times their only jobs are not to die, to pay their bills and not get fired. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, that's, believe it or not, that's, you know, where I am with two kids and uh, practice and employees, dude, trust me, guys, it gets harder and crazier and your time gets crunched. And in that time in your life, it's it's harder to kind of take those stakes and, and put them in the ground and say, hey, you know, I I want to buy a $1.2 million home in the Burbs in the next four years, retire by 55 and have a cash reserve and go on a couple vacations a year. Whatever your goals are, most 25, 26 year olds aren't, aren't doing that aren't doing that. And and I don't blame them, right? I don't blame them because it takes maturity and experience in life. But what most people do, regardless of age, is react to their financial circumstances. And that's that's the inferior way to approach it. The, the superior way is to be proactive. And it's okay if your goals change. I'm not asking you to have your whole life figured out, right. but I'm asking you to say, I'm asking for your goal not to be, I want to make sick bank, bro. Like <laughs> fucking stupid goal, stupid goal. They're going to get memed. Yeah. No, it, yeah. And, and I think it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's spot on because, I mean, there are people that they get their bonus, they'll spend it on a watch, they'll do, uh, you know, they'll go to the clubs. And obviously, I mean, like, I've been there, Mark's been there, I'm sure you've been there, uh, mm -hmm. old college Doug was there, uh, for sure. <laughs> but um, hey, hey, look, in Gainesville, you could get a beer for a nickel, so yeah, you know, it, wasn't, go, but, it wasn't, wasn't hard to party. Yeah, um, but it's like, you know, people... These these guys work in finance and um, and females. So I'm, I, I just say guys as you know, same here, uh, all inclusive. But you're working in finance. You're building models, and you should be able to do that. But they don't, right? Like uh, forecasting out to the future and like building up your cash reserve. Yeah, again, a lot of it a function of just not having solid foundation, uh, foundational finance and personal finance, or let's just call it money management. It's easier to say that for a broader audience. Um, it's not being taught to you. We're not. We're not getting these things. You know, you you can uh, you can do the Pythagorean theorem, but you can't you can't balance your your checking account. Like that's yeah. really a thing we do anymore. But that those, those simple, boring. I don't want to do it because it's simple and boring and not cool. Want to know what's cool? Stonks, crypto. <laughs> you know gambling, making money, risk, reward, dude. That That's where the memes are made, right? That's where the money's made too. But all of that's for naught unless you got, you know, you would never build 
a house on shaky ground. The right. slightest wind will come and knock that shit right over. Yeah. Are you going to do that for your financial life? Yeah. Have fun in a 20% correction recession. I've, I've done, I've lived it. You know, we've mm-hmm. done it. Right. I've seen the worst almost twice now. Dude, last year was nuts. It could have easily gone the other way. Thanks, Jay Powell. Thank you. You know, like, eh, we'll see how that turns out in the end. But for now, like, we got bailed out there, got bailed out, you know, event- uh, inevitably in 0809, but it, it had setbacks associated with it, ones that really ra- uh, ravaged our, you know, millennials twice now. You know, millennials just getting started. So now geriatric millennials like me coming into our careers, 0809. You got a couple kids, you learn daycare shut down. There's a, a, a virus spreading across the globe, killing people. You don't know what to make of it. Yeah, I'm working in the financial markets. The, it's plummeting. Clients, I'm like, here we go again. And and I think, thank God I had the 0, 0809 experience because I, I was ready. I knew something like that. I didn't know it would be a pandemic, but I could bank on something silly happening in the markets where I would need to take all the lessons I got from 0809 and -hmm. bring them into present day. So look, you know, 20 something year old working in finance, making good money, you know, hold on, man. You, You know, you got so much time ahead of you. You do, you got time on your side, you know, rather than compound returns, compound your life. Ooh, that, that will be the quote you use, you know, to, to pump this episode, but that's the, that's the God's honest truth. And, and I'll give you, I'll give you one other thing. Like I have clients in their mid to late thirties and even forties, you know, high earners, New York, it takes a long time to get your family in that two, three bedroom, you know, co-op in Brooklyn, because that's $3 million. You're saving up eight to 900 grand. So you could be making eight, 900 grand as a household, but you got kids, you're still moving forward with your life. Asset accumulation has been on the back burner for a lot of clients in their 30s, in late 30s. And you got, you're telling me people in their 20s feel like they're poor? I mean, it's again, just, it's just, a rel- it's just relative and pressures. And you want to, abs- if you want to absolve yourself of that, go build the strongest foundation for you humanly possible, and you'll feel like a king or queen. Going back, one question that I have for you that I think when I think about my parents who my dad was in the military for 22 years, worked for the same, you know, United States of America for a long time, you're getting paid the same amount each week, right? And something that I think is more unique for millennials and Gen Z is this variability of income, whether you're an investment banking analyst or a lawyer where a lot of your total salary for the year comes in bonus or you're a content creator or something, you know, it it changes. How do you help people address that? And is that something that you see a lot with your practice? Because you're, you're, most of your clients are what, like 400,000 to 1.2-ish million that they're making a year? How, yeah. how would you describe that base? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a pretty big spread, right? Like 400 to 1.2 or into multiple seven figures. And you know, you're talking about still another big spread with age ranges, 28 to generally 42 year olds. But I love that question. And I love that question because it is something that comes up in practice all the time. Um, when you have earners who get the vast majority of their compensation from either bonus or commission, right? So if you're in sales or you're just working in uh, industries where you know you're paid that way, you get a lot of variability in cash flow. And the more you skew it towards the variability, the harder cash management becomes. So you really got to work with those clients even that much further with cash management and, and cash flow. And and this is the foundational area that I was referring to just a second ago, like getting mm-hmm. intimately familiar with money in, money out. Getting good here is what pays you the dividend throughout your entire life. So what we do is try and create high, medium, low cash flow scenarios. Show me you know, like what income looks like in a particularly bad year where like if you do it again, you're getting fired. What, you know, hey, you hit you hit your marks, like no one's really impressed by you, but glad you, you know, managed to do okay and it was a good year. And then you blew it out of the water, like what's exceptional. And you take those numbers and you and you're able to basically paint the picture of what cash flow and therefore lifestyle, right? Two sides of the coin here, comfortable, Mm -hmm. subjectively comfortable lifestyle weighed up against consistent ability to save and invest. So you can show the two sides of that coin in each of that scenario and set reasonable expectations for what it's going to look like. And they can toggle between these depending on how they feel their year is shaping up or what production is looking like or what bonus season is going to look like. You know, in in a normal setting, you want to bank all bonuses, try and live with 
than you know base salaries. A lot of times in banking, you know, whether it's one, you know, hundred percent of your uh, base salary is coming to you as a bonus, you know, give or take 20 percent based on outperformance or underperformance, or yeah. or just what the company has done as a whole. Um, a lot of times, those folks can live in their base salaries, assuming they're not yellowing bottles every night. I know plenty of people who who do that and have very little to show for it, right? But that's how we handle variability in cash flow. It's it's a really big planning topic for the demographic that we're talking about here, whether it's just millennials or, or specifically folks who who have large pieces of their compensation uh, tied to bonus and commission. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I learned about uh, when I first got in the industry was spend your salary and save the bonus. And I don't know if that was good advice or not, but uh, that advice. was the mentality that a lot of people had uh, in, in investment banking. Yeah, my my clients who've done that in sales or banking or, or any function where where that's how the comp structure looks like tend to do extremely well for themselves. Not only because they are able to bank those bonuses and you know have their cash reserves and start accumulating assets, but it created great discipline in managing their lifestyles throughout their career. Because you know that that's where trouble that's where trouble comes when you when you just start eating into bonuses to live a lifestyle. I mean, clearly, um, it's not hard to see why that could be a bad thing. Right. In talking about kind of the viewpoint of traditional financial advisors, there's a lot of disruption in your industry with robo advisors, everything like that, with technology coming into play. How do you how do you do that? How do you incorporate technology into your practice? And what do you see the future holding for the financial advisory industry? Yeah, yeah. It's it's going to be shifting more and more and more towards the value centered around advice and planning drifting more and more away from the investment management piece. Now, let me really clarify that because I don't think AUM, uh, assets under management, is going anywhere anytime soon, but I do think the value will become increasingly more diluted. Um, And I think limited is really the better word. So I tell my prospects and clients straight to their face, there is limited value I can generate for you in the investment management uh, phase. And that is for most retail investors who aren't getting into alts and have built up enough capital to go explore some things where maybe there are less efficient markets and you can generate alpha. Uh, And I'll be forthcoming with you. I don't even know how amazing I am at that in the alt space, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality here is that the value is going to be limited because you have robos, because you're commoditizing investment management, because you can do this for free and it's frictionless and there's Robin Hood. Not even Robin Hood. I mean, come on. They Maybe they forced Schwab and, and everyone in Fidelity to do it for free as well. Look, you can save 1% a year or whatever the uh, financial advisor is managing by DIY. But I got news for you. My clients don't want to do it. They know how to do it. They, they're chasing kids around, working 80 hours a week, or maybe they just want to actually enjoy their weekend and not rebalance an 80-20 portfolio across a number of ETFs, despite how easy it is. And then I got clients who love to do that. They'll pay for financial planning, which brings me over to where... So again, we can do the heavy lifting. Uh, value is subjective. Uh, a lot of folks have no issues paying whatever fee it is to do the investment management, whether it be boring, passive indexing, and just rebalancing. They don't want to do it. It's valuable. But the real value... Right, the real, real value that's almost unlimited and for days comes from planning and advice. And good CFPs know this: cash management, insurance planning, investment planning, retirement, tax, and estate. Throw college education planning on top of that, and you got what makes up comprehensive planning. You do this process year in and year out. Build relationships around it. Know people's financial lives so they can make great financial decisions for themselves. Have an accountability buddy, a coach, a confidant. All of that. That's a lot of value. What's that worth? Well, it's worth what your flat financial planning fee says it's worth. It's worth what your asset management fee might say it's worth because your bundling services, an hourly rate, my clients can work with me however I want. But what I want to make abundantly clear is where they're getting value. And it's kind of weird to help people with their investments and tell them how they might want to manage their money when you don't really know anything about them or their financial lives. Think about that. Mm -hmm. We really came from an entire era of go buy this stock. I got a hot pick. The broker mentality. We 
broke the back of that, man, but it still exists today. So again, value for days and planning and advice and creating relationships. Robos can't threaten that. I guess, look, we can we can go Ready Player One. Uh, you know, we can go Metaverse. We can go AI and machine learning to where a robot is able to, you know, read these feelings and emotions that we have as humans. But, you know, come on. That's not tomorrow. It's not 10 years. And I don't know. I'm not going to put my foot in my mouth if it's like 15 years from now. Maybe I'll be retired yeah. <laughs> by then. But you get the point, right? That's where we're trending. That's where we're going. If you're a practitioner, be nimble. Know that that could happen. Structure your business in a way to take advantage of shifts and changes. I'm, you know, I'm a solo with two staff. I can turn my ship very fast because of the technology and the foresight and just being young and growing up and all of these things. Yeah, but if you're Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, UBS, big bank, or multi-billion dollar RIA that's been around 40 years and haven't become nimble, riding those ships and turning those bad boys is very hard to do, especially when there's a board of trustees and shareholders who want earnings today, not 10 years from now. I think one of the beautiful things we learned from you during this interview was think different, that just because something has been done one way by one generation, I mean, look at us, we we work for a meme page now. So never be afraid to challenge the orthodox thinking. And then you'll grow a massive business like yourself and just do things differently. We love it. Thanks, man. What is the best way for people to find you to contact you aside from Twitter? Yeah, I need I need Instagram followers. So Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> all right everyone go follow doug on instagram yeah. there we go let me let me steal that do you have a tiktok too no i don't i and, oh. and i oh. not because i don't want to it's because i really want to do video and i and i i will you know i will do a reels or or something like that um it, it's time consuming man doing you video work on your dance moves yeah yeah and just not the dance moves but just cutting editing video i've i've made many mm -hmm. attempts to do to do that kind of content and you know unless unless you do have a whole team of editors and producers or a turnkey solution is actually you know not not very not very amenable to to your time so unfortunately the video stuff has gone by the wayside no tiktok but if you want to find me you know the bona fide wealth you can google doug bonaparte and it's going to pop up twitter is honestly the best way to do it you can slide into a dm instagram if, if you can't get a hold of me you're bad at this <laughs> well douglas thank you so much it's been a pleasure to talk to you thanks guys this has been awesome best of luck with the show congrats on all the success all right so now we're flipping the page to the appendix so for today's appendix, we are going to go through a couple of submissions that we received a couple months ago for a giveaway that we're doing in partnership with Ansarada, the virtual data room. Now for these submissions, what we're going to do is submit them to you guys, our shareholders, to vote on who wins these Super Bowl tickets. We have four stories that we're going to roll through. Two are hero stories in the bullpen and two are horror stories. So without further ado, let should we kick this off? Let's do it. I'm excited. This is going to be good, guys. So our first story that, you know, so all of these are anonymously submitted. We'll throw this vote out there later today. And let's pick people to go to L.A. to watch a Super Bowl who have dealt with some shit. The first story is a hero story. And it is, I used to have my managing director's credit card. Lunch, coffees, client events, etc. It was the same credit card I had. One Monday, I came into the office and my managing director asked me how my weekend was. I said, pretty low key, nothing crazy, thanks. He smiled, asked if I wanted to revise that answer, and proceeded to ask how the table was Saturday night at the club we had been at. I accidentally used his card instead of mine. <laughs> I had a minor panic attack as he sat there smiling, only to say, consider it an early bonus. And we will never talk about this again. That's a pretty good one. That's good. Yeah. I, That's a nice MD. Very nice. I, I'm just glad he probably did not get any strippers on that on that card. So. Well, it usually doesn't show up, you know, as something like recognizable. It'd be hard. To, not that I would. Not oh, that I would know. Yeah. But are you sure? I have friends <laughs> who would know. Yeah, I, I, I got a guy who who just tells me all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, we, well, we're living in the metaverse. We don't do this in real life. <laughs> okay, so that was our first hero story. Now for our first horror story, which honestly, I got to say that I love this one. Analyst had Tinder up 
on the projector in a conference room. The managing director came in calling out the, and this is a direct quote, easy, hot ass, end quote. First off, just a disclaimer, we do not support that language. His wife's profile came up (laughs) on the fourth swipe. The managing director proceeded to walk out the door, close the door to his office to make phone calls. He cut out at like 3 p.m. and two days later had our analyst setting up his Tinder profile. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty, I mean, I, I, I would think you'd want to go with the league or hinge at that, that age. But what, what do you think? <laughs> Seeking arrangement, perhaps? Yeah, well, I would say like whoever submitted this is actually not the, the victim of this horror story. I, I would say if we select this one, the MD is the one I think should actually end up going to the Super Bowl. But I don't know. Tinder, Tinder you know, could be... I don't know what that MD's into, but, it, you know, different strokes for different yeah, folks. Yeah, ba- back in the day when I was on it, it was just a little, you know, the, the quality wasn't where I wanted it to be. So I'm only hinged these days. There you have it. Find Mark on Hinge. The DMs are better, though. I prefer to work that way. Lit, uh, why don't you take the next two? Sure. All right. Let's see. Uh, So we're back to the hero stories. So let's get into this one. This hero story comes from Wells Fargo. A good friend and MBA associate was working with an analyst on a brutal sell side in power and utilities. The analyst hadn't slept in days and fainted while on a call with my friend. Or that's what it sounded like. My friend lived in a different city and started trying to reach people in his group, the staffer, colleagues, etc. But no one was helpful and said it was probably nothing. He was able to friend the analyst's girlfriend on Instagram through a mutual friend and they let her know something was up. She rushed home and turns out he had a seizure at his standing desk from the lack of sleep and the high stress. He hit his head and was bleeding out on his floor for hours. Had the associate not gone out of his way to take care of his analyst and confirm he was okay, he likely would have died. Pour one out for that hero, the first MBA associate ever to be useful. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Shots fired. (laughs) Shots fired? That is fucking wild. That's nuts. But I mean, good, good for them. Like, honestly, we need more good people out there in the world. So bravo to that anonymous individual. Yeah, I mean, wow. I hope they're okay and maybe even left Wells Fargo to greener pastures. Namora. Namora, yeah. So, wow, okay. I mean, that, that that's a... It's kind of a heavy one. That Yeah, that's a heavy one. I don't know how to process having things because, uh, you know, my way of coping is just by You have no emotion, just yeah. ratio someone online. Exactly. All right, so let's get to the last one, which is a pretty lengthy horror story so this one comes by well uh, i can't say the bank uh but this one's pretty funny and you can probably guess just based on the uh financials that this guy uh you know sort of gave so okay let's get into this one when i was an analyst i was tasked with trying to sell one of the worst manufacturing companies you will ever see we're talking significantly negative ebitda their lunch was being eaten by a foreign competitor Yada, yada, yada. Sounds like Baird Industrials. Well, we'll see. So the MD, the VP, and associate had all given up on this project after we reached out to 130 buyers and were told no by everyone, something that probably never happened to Mark at Centerview. Never. (laughs) You know you are in deep trouble when you've Googled every sub $100 million private equity fund named insert plant or direction slash different type of rock capital and can't even get one NDA. That's fucking bad. There was one yes, however, this random Chinese industrial manufacturing company. Coincidentally, the chairman of this company happened to be childhood friends with one of our clients' board members. How convenient. Needless to say, when someone on the deal team had to go to West Virginia of all places to man- wild and wonderful baby <laughs> yeah. had to go to West Virginia to man the site visit diligent sessions etc my name was picked I rented hotel rooms and conference rooms in the finest hotel West Virginia had to offer a Marriott and gathered the management team and client to start the day 
This was after I personally picked up the Chinese team contingent at the tiny one lane airport in my rented cube van. In the war room, our management team eagerly picked out their lunch options from the Marriott menu. And just as we were about to start, a representative from the buyer contingent came into the room saying, the chairman has requested a nap following the flight and would like to delay uh, today's meeting to later this afternoon. That's fucking big swinging duck material. For whatever reason, like Texas, <laughs> people are just bigger <laughs> in West Virginia. It, it, it's true. Well, they have, you know, one, uh, if they're not in the bottom two or the top two, depending on how you look at it, of morbidly obese. But like, those are my oh, people, man. my next door neighbor growing up. There you go. Virginia. And then you got West Virginia. A little geography for Virginia uh, of the West, as I like to say. <laughs> so when I told the eight, 250 to 400 pound men that lunch was canceled they were not happy campers Ooh. and i slightly feared for my life when the chairman finally awoke from his slumber he wanted to get food first so i chauffeured him to, or chauffeured them to the one chinese quote unquote chinese restaurant in town in reality it had food from every asian country including india and a scraggly looking man in overalls and a trucker hat, I kid you not, <laughs> sat us down. <laughs> uh, very authentic. I zeroed in on the safe and sound general cells per usual, and the contingent began chatting up the waitress in Chinese. When they finished, I was about to order when the waitress began abruptly collecting the menus. They had already ordered for everyone, it seems. Admittedly, they made some good choices here. Finally, we go back to the hotel to do the meeting. I had booked out the conference room for the next three full days in anticipation of intense negotiations and due diligence. I gave the usual introductions and said the time was theirs, the buyers, to ask any questions they wanted of the management team. Their spokesman said they had only one question. <laughs> when I say one question, I literally mean it was one question. How is your relationship with the unions? The eight management team members looked around at each other, nodding approvingly, and finally the CEO said, pretty good, I'd say. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, the buyer talked amongst themselves in Chinese for a minute and finally said, thank you, no more questions. Three days of meetings <laughs> lasted all of five minutes. <laughs> now with two entire days to kill, the next day the management team and I took them on a whirlwind tour of West Virginia. For well, that lunch. sounds fun. <laughs> oh, so for, for some <laughs> for lunch, someone thought it was a good idea to take the contingent to Hooters, which was painfully oh, hell awkward. Yeah. <laughs> they must have been in either uh, Charleston or Morgantown. Not yeah, I, that I know I, the two Hooters in West Virginia, but. But you've never been there. You know this from some friends, right? No, I actually, I, I like Hooters. I mean, I don't think the wings actually, I have a wild story I'll tell what? later about there was a potential Hooters spec that I got wind of in who they were going to make the CEO. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's get, yeah, let, let's get back into this one. So for lunch. So, you know, these uh, 250 to 400 pound men thought it would be a good idea to take, you know, the, the Chinese team to Hooters, which was painfully awkward as they were looking around <laughs> oh wide eyed God. with zero shame. At the end of the meal, the chairman taps his glass and makes a toast through the translator. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your warm hospitality and for these beautiful women. We would like to buy your company. Amazing. Amazing deals getting done at Hooters <laughs> sub hundred million dollar deals industrials in West Virginia getting done at Hooters that is fucking wild you know what like it just goes to show you it, you know business is really all about EQ rather than IQ you take some foreign businessmen to a Hooters in West Virginia and you got the deal done <laughs> let that be a lesson to everyone so with all that, we'll throw these four horror and hero stories out there for our shareholders to vote and send two people to the Super Bowl. Thanks so much again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. This has been Big Swinging Decks by Liquidity with your hosts Lit and Mark Moran. 
This is a Red Rock Music Podcast and is powered by ACAST. Our executive producer is Red Yoakum. Our associate producer is Emma Martins. For more, follow us on Instagram at Liquidity and at It's Mark Moran. Or visit the official website, liquidity.co. So tune in weekly to your managing director secretary's favorite podcast. Available wherever you listen to podcasts.